Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, lions and leopards. Get to know South Africa's big cats. Presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Lorraine Doyle. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Take it away, Lorraine. Hi, Rob. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to present again. Um, and I hope that um, what I'll go through today will perhaps, I mean, some people may already know um, a fair amount about these big cats, um, but I hope that I can impart something um, more about them um, as as um, as a species or as two different species um, being lions and leopards which are really if we look at the true big cats of of um, southern africa those are really our two big cats both belonging to the genus panthera um, and cheetahs can be classified either as the smallest of the large cats or the largest of the small cats um, and actually, probably the largest of the smaller cats is more appropriate for them, um, just because of their build, um, the fact that they're a completely unique genus or unique species um, that's not shared with any other um, with any other animal on Earth. Um, and so, lions and leopards, from a safari perspective, I think are are you know the two big cats um, that people um, really like to see. So for anyone who hasn't met me, um, this was taken a while ago, last year sometime in the Kalahari. Um, so yeah, that's kind of me in my natural habitat. So what I've done um, today is I've um, essentially split the presentation up into lions and leopards. Um, and then what I've done is just go through um, a little bit of the kind of life history, if you will, um, in terms of the chronological um, progression and age, um, and then looking at some of the aspects of their lives um, that make them um, really interesting and unique. So to start off, um, early life. So these little lion cubs, um, this photograph was actually taken at Mala Mala. Now these cubs are very young um, and probably eight weeks. And normally you wouldn't get the opportunity to see cubs of this age because um, the mom will be hiding them. And also from an ethical point of view, um, we don't really promote viewing small cubs until they're about 12 weeks old. But this female decided very early on that she wanted to introduce these tiny little cubs to the pride. Um, obviously, they got a little bit bullied um, and she took them back again. But she then proceeded to keep coming out with these little cubs into the open. Um, and they, she was very relaxed. They were relaxed around the vehicle. Um, and so there was some tightly controlled um, viewing allowed. Um, but as you can see, um, these their eyes are still even, they've still got a little bit of the blue in their eyes, um, but pretty mobile, um, very curious. Um, and I think just to get a perspective of size, um, you can see now when they are next to mom, um, you know, just how tiny these little guys are um, when they are small. So if you look at the size of this little one compared to the size of mum's foot, um, you get, you really get a perspective of it. Um, so lionesses will start having cubs from anywhere from three to four years of age. Um, and they can go on having cubs until 12 or 13 years of age. Um, so normally litters can be anywhere between two, four. Sometimes you get bigger litters, um, but that's kind of the sort of average size. Um, 
and mortality amongst the big cat cubs is actually quite high, um, both from um, infanticide, where you would have potentially male lions who are not the fathers of the cubs coming in and killing them, um, other things like hyenas, um, and certainly in the case of leopards, you will have, you could have lions killing leopard cubs. So they're very, very vulnerable um, when they are, when they are small. Um, and one of the advantages that lions have because of their um, social structure is there's, because they're more of a unit, um, they tend to have a little bit more protection um, for their cubs and females will, if one female has cubs and another one has cubs, they will allo suckle. So they will suckle one another's cubs. Um, so as they get a little bit bigger, um, you can still see they are very spotty when they are born. Um, as they get older, the spots do fade, um, but even on adult lions, you will see spots. Um, and as they start growing, so they become more mischievous. Um, and this little lion had decided that he had found a piece of wood um, and he was going to play with it. Um, you can also see quite nicely there how his claws, you can see the sheathing on the claws. Um, and so obviously lions and leopards have fully retractile claws, but they will often take them out or push them out like this um, and scratch on things. And that's also to clean the, to make sure that they keep the nail clean. So when it retracts into the sheath, they're not at risk of getting infection in their, in their nails. Um, you can also get a sense of how big this cub will become. If you look at the size of his paws, um, they're massive compared to the size of the overall animal. Um, so yeah, a good indicator that it's going to be a large cat. So this particular pride um, is a well-known pride within the greater Sabi Sands, the greater Kruger. Um, and on this particular day, they had decided to take up residence um, right on the airstrip. And so the white stones you can see in the foreground are the markers um, for the plains. It actually spells out the name of the reserve. And they had decided that this was where they were going to um, stay. And they stayed there for quite a while. But as you can see here, you've got a mom. Um, these are not all her cubs. Um, there were other females who were lying further away. But this very social structure that these young lions um, will grow up in, um, which is in significant contrast to leopards, um, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later on. So yeah, a um, lot of um, sibling rivalry, um, a lot of affection between them. Um, I mean, they really are at this age, um, you know, they are learning everything um, that it is that it takes um, essentially to become um, a lion. So they are playful. And um, just in this series of pictures, um, this just kind of highlights for me what little lion cubs are about. So first of all, they tackle mom. So I'm going to sit on mom's head and bite mom's ear. Mom is tolerant. Then I'm going to kick mom in the eye. Mom is still tolerant of this. Then mom's had enough. <laughs> and so she's like gently disciplining this little cub um, by she's got like his one of his paws in her mouth and she's like she's giving him a telling off um, and they will discipline their cubs um, because obviously, you know, they um, unruly behavior, um, especially in a pride structure, um, you know, is going to is going to potentially lead to fights um, and so mums will these lionesses will discipline um, these youngsters the, the youngsters are unperturbed they'll just go and play with each other so 
if mom's not going to play anymore, well, we'll just go and play with each other. Then they get bored of doing this. So then they go and bother auntie. So one of the other female lionesses um, was quite happily lying there having a sleep. Um, and suddenly she had um, these cubs pouncing on her. Well, eventually, when she'd had enough, they decide, okay, well, maybe we'll just go and we'll just go and lie down and be quiet for a while. Um, and this is very typical of, of cub behavior, very active um, early in the morning, later in the afternoon, generally for the rest of the day, um, less active. Um, but when they are this age, they are starting everything they do is honing their skills. So whatever they play, whatever play they engage in, um, it's play fighting, it's play tackling, which would teach them how to take down prey later on. Um, so this is a very, um, obviously a formative period um, of, their, of their life. And this is really from the age of about 12 weeks, so three months, um, right the way through until nearly 18 months of age, um, that they are kind of in their cub phase, um, if you will. And then we become, then they go on to become basically adolescents. Um, and this is very noticeable, especially in the males, because now the males start to grow their mane. So their testosterone levels go up around the age of two, um, and they start growing a mane. So for a while, between sort of two and four years of age, they look pretty strange um, they get these sort of mohawk hairstyles um, and they really do look a little bit um, a little bit shaggy a bit strange but this is the development of the mane um, which obviously is there for protection of um, their neck their windpipe really for when they are um, the males are fighting um, it gives them some protection. Um, it's also um, utilized in sexual selection by the females. Um, so, you know, the bigger and potentially darker the mane, although that can happen purely because of the genetics. You get blonde males and darker males. But um, the females will know that a lion that's got this full, luxurious mane um, is potentially um you know going to make has good genetics um to sire cubs so play at this sort of stage starts to become a little bit more serious um and again this is all about um this was this was play um between most likely a brother and a sister um but you can just see that you now start because you've obviously got much more bulk much more size um, you know, you've got um, another level that comes up, but you can see now how muscular and developed um, they are, but his mane is still very um, kind of sparse and has, he's got a lot of growing to do before he would be um, considered an adult um, male lion. So then into adulthood, um, so this is when the males have reached sexual maturity um, and you start to get these beautiful, luxuriant manes. Um, and really the role of male lions within um, a pride structure is that they are there as protection for the pride. So very often when you see the pride, you will see the females and the cubs and maybe the adolescents but there's no sign of the big dominant males. And that's because they are patrolling their territories. Um, and that's a pretty big job to have to do. So um, yes, male lions could be considered quite lazy. Um, they're not particularly good um, hunters because of their bulk. Um, and so they will, if they have the opportunity, leave a lot of the killing of prey to females but they are more than capable of killing their own prey if they need to. Um, but as I say, they're 
their hunting efficacy is not that high. Um, lions as a whole are not um, the, the most successful by far of, of um, hunters. Maybe 30 to 40 percent successful in their hunts. Um, so yeah, that's not a particularly high um, success rate. So here you can see the mane has become um, a lot more full um, and you can start to see now the scarring that starts to appear on the face. Um, also, if you have a look at um, his nose, his nose has gone completely black. So there's some tiny little pink spots on it. But when they are younger, their noses are pink. And as they get older, um, the noses start to go a lot darker. Um, so it's not a particularly reliable way, but um, you know, it gives you an indication that it's not a very young animal. So this is a behavior that is practiced by um, male lions, um, leopards, and many other species of mammals. And um, this is called a phlegm and grimace. Um, and what is happening is um, they have an organ in the roof of their mouth called the vomeronasal organ. And what they do is they pass the scent from females urine over that organ, which will um, detect whether the female is an estrus or not. So based on the hormone levels, um, they can then detect whether a female is ready to mate with. Um, and so, yeah, this kind of almost looks like a snarl, um, but it isn't actually a snarl. Um, is them practicing a phlegm and grimace. Can't really see it that well, but you, you can kind of see all the papillae on the tongue. Um, their tongue is so rough that um, it will lick the skin off a carcass. Um, so yeah, very, 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 very strong um, tongues. And just to give you an idea here, you get to give you a perspective of size difference between the males and the females. Um, this is an adult male and an adult female. Um, and as you can see, he is substantially larger than she is. Um, he was also doing some territorial marking here. So he was urinating and then scraping his feet in it, um, which is typical uh, behavior of, of, a dominant, of a dominant male. So then some of the things that happen within um, a pride. So allo grooming is something that um, is very common amongst lions. And it serves the function of helping clean one another. But its primary function is one of developing bonds between members of the pride. Um, and it starts from very young. So these cubs um, will groom each other. Their mothers will groom them. Um, and you will see, for example, um, these two lions had literally just, they'd been separated, now being reunited. Um, and the first thing that they will do is they will come and basically rub heads with each other, um, reestablishing their, um, their bond, their kinship. Um, and this is a very, very strong part um, of lion sociality. Um, and what keeps that bond together. Um, not only amongst the females, this is two um, young males, two brothers, um, exactly the same situation, um, being separated for a while and on being reunited, they will um, make contact like that um, again. Um, yeah, here, I mean, this is a bit of a sideways one, but again, it's a cub with her mum, with its mother, um, just making sure that that bond um, gets reestablished. So when you are a pride animal um, or a group living animal, you have to have a means of communication. Um, if you are separated um, or if, for example, with males, um, if one has gone off patrolling a territory and maybe he encounters another male, um, it's important that he can then summon his brother as part of that coalition to come and support him. Um, and so 
that's where um, communication in terms of lions becomes really, really important. Um, and this particular morning was a really sort of, it was a chilly morning. It was, there was still quite a lot of dew on the grass. Um, and this female was very intent. She'd been looking around and it was clear that she was looking for something, but was it prey? Was it not? What could it possibly be? Um, and then she started calling. Um, and just because of the kind of um, the light that was there on that particular morning, you could actually see the spray coming out of her mouth. Um, and what she was doing is what we, we call contact calling. So it later transpired that she'd been separated from other members of her pride um, for some reason. And she is now contact calling them to say, I'm out here, where are you? Um, and she will then listen for them to contact call her back. Um, so it's a way of them being able to find each other again if they've been separated. So then the more um, vocal and the one that kind of goes through you um, with a chill is obviously the roar that um, these big males can make. So females can also roar. Um, it's just not quite as um, loud um, or as strident as it is amongst males. Um, but you can see he's sort of starting. It feels, often sounds a little bit like they're winding up. Um, and then they go into a full blown roar. Um, and then it tails off again with the sort of grunting. Um, and this is also, um, it can be a almost an extreme form, if you will, of contact calling. But this is also announcing their presence um, and announcing that this is my territory. Best you don't come into it. So it's advertising to other males in an area that this belongs to me and my brother or whether it's a bigger coalition or even just a single male. Um, but it's advertising that this is this belongs to us. So obviously, as carnivores, um, they are um, very dependent on uh, meat um, as food. So they're really not, you'll see leopards will um, often, leopards will take strange things. I mean, they're quite capable of taking little birds and other smaller things. Whereas lions are really much more hyper -carniv um, carnivorous. Um, and so it's really important for them um, that they are able to, to get um, large prey from time to time. So when lions find, have a big kill, um, they will literally gorge feed. So they will feed so much that they can't even roll over. Um, and that is because um, it's not known where the next meal might come from. So you eat as much as you can when you've got it. Um, and there's a very distinct hierarchy in lions where males will feed first, then adult females and cubs get last. Um, very different from something like wild dogs where the pups will get to feed first. Lions, it's very much about, um, about the adult males, the protectors of the pride. Um, they're not too particular or fussy about what they will eat. This carcass was there for a number of days um, and it really didn't smell very nice and he literally had his nose right in it. So we're not sure this was a giraffe carcass but they didn't kill the giraffe. We think it may have died of natural causes um, but that they certainly weren't worried about that. Um, they got tucked right in. So it starts at a young age. So um, these calves were probably about five or six months old um, there's a kill um, and they will join in with the rest of the pride when they get given the opportunity. So just in terms of um, activity, so what what is it that lions kind of get up to? Well, as I said in the beginning, when they're little, they get up to quite a lot. Um, 
So this one literally fell sort of head first off the branch and landed up doing a handstand, which I don't think was actually intentional. Um, so they play a lot. Um, and as they get older, it becomes less. Um, but they also will learn mom is watching and mom is vigilant. I'm going to watch and be vigilant. Um, this little chap was actually watching some guinea fowl, which were just um, a bit further away. And it was quite funny at one point. He decided that it was wide open. It was the airfield. And he was going to go and stalk these guinea fowl in the open, um, which, of course, didn't, you know, it did not end successfully for him. But nonetheless, that activity is teaching him. Um, so cubs learning from from adults, this female was drinking, um, her cubs were with her, and they are, everything is, is basically a learning curve as they sort of engage in this daily activity. Um, they were having just a bit of fun in the water. And then they sleep a lot. So because lions um, eat these large meals of protein, um, very difficult to digest. It takes a long time to digest meat. And so one of the things that they do is they will eat these big meals and then they will sleep. So it is not unusual on safaris to see flat cats, we call them. Um, and this is the typical sleeping lion. And it doesn't matter what size they are, there's a good chance at some point on a safari you're going to see a sleeping lion. So I said I'd sort of split this up into um, the chronological age, as if you will, of, of the lions and the leopards. Um, and so the, this sort of the next section um, is looking um, more at, at leopards. So leopards have a completely different structure in terms of the way in which they conduct their, their life. They are very solitary cats. Um, you will occasionally see maybe three leopards together. Often that will be a mom and her offspring. Um, it can occasionally be a mom, a current, her current cubs, and an older cub who may have been allowed closer again, if it, particularly if it's a female. Um, but in comparison to lions, um, which really are the only truly social cats that we know of currently. Um, leopards have this completely different um, life strategy. And obviously, because of that, everything about them in terms of the way that they behave, um, their coloration, everything is, is different. Um, and if you just have a look at this cub, the first thing that well, one of the things you'll notice is just how incredibly long their whiskers are. So the correct name or the scientific name, whatever you would for um, whiskers, is vibrissi. And those are highly sensitive hairs. Um, and actually, they will always be the widest part of a leopard. And so that's why leopards can get through the tiniest of gaps that you would look at it and go, no way is this getting through there. Provided it can get its whisk, the edges of its whiskers through, it will get the rest of itself through that gap. Um, lions do not have anywhere close um, to whiskers of that length. Um, neither do cheetahs, uh, because they just they have a different strategy um, of the way that they live and the way that they hunt. So you will see that. With leopard cubs, um, females may have one or two, sometimes even three cubs. Um, very high mortality rate amongst leopard cubs. Um, again, male leopards will kill will kill cubs that are not theirs. Um, hyenas will find dens and kill um, cubs. Lions will find dens and kill cubs. Um, so very, again, very, very vulnerable. So this little cub went, there's actually two cubs um, that this female had. But what was interesting was this cub went from lying there 
basically almost asleep to sitting up and having clearly something has got my attention um, to really becoming quite aware of the situation, that cocked tail. Um, and what was actually going on here was there was a hyena. So there was a kill that the mom had made, which was up in a tree. And there was a hyena prowling around. Um, and mom was getting quite um, aggressive and angry with this um, hyena. Um, but it was interesting to see how these how the cub was reacting um, to the presence of the hyena and the way in which the mum was was interacting with it. Um, so this was another female and and her cub. Um, so very much solitary. Um, the males mate with the females and leave. There is no parental care from the males. Um, all the raising of the cubs is done by a single female by the mother. Um, so no um, assistance from sisters or other other leopards, um, very much just mother and cubs. So again, because um, so leopards again reach they reach sexual maturity more or less around the same time as lions do. Um, so you would have a gestation period of about three months, which is the same for domestic cats. Um, and then you have this kind of cubby stage, which lasts until they're just about two years of age. Um, and then they become adolescent and they start becoming independent. Um, so whereas with lions, females, when they become independent, they stick together. So they will stay together for life. So the core structure of a pride of lions is, um, is females and their offspring. Um, whereas with leopards, the minute they become independent, um, male or female, um, they, they leave. Um, and the, if they don't leave, the female will push them out. Sometimes what will happen with a female, if she has a female cub, she may give a portion of her territory to a female cub. Um, just It just helps secure that territory. Um, if it's a male, it won't happen. Um, males will get pushed out. They must go and find their own um, territories. It's a very vulnerable point in a leopard's life, especially the young males, because now they're going to move into territories of dominant males. Um, and if the dominant males find them, they will kill them. Um, so, yeah, pretty vulnerable. And you can kind of detect that in the way that this cub is, is kind of looking around because it's just very, very cautious um, of the whole situation around it. It's very aware um, and it doesn't yet have the confidence of an adult to know, you know, what is a threat, what isn't a threat. Um, so very, very much a learning um, stage. And as you can see, um, still, I mean, um, still a relatively large cat, but definitely not a full grown leopard, um, especially not a full grown leopard male. Um, and you can see from the size again of the paws here, um, just how much growing um, that he still has to do uh, in order to sort of grow into his paws. You can also see here quite nicely, um, in some areas, the rosettes that get spoken about on leopards and jaguars, that kind of um, ring of spots with a lighter center. But you will have noticed that on their heads, um, they have that same dark um, single spots that you would see on a cheetah. Um, again, you can see that the nose is still quite pink. Um, so again, it hasn't, it hasn't, um, gone completely black, um, which it will do as it becomes um, an adult. So as they go into adulthood, um, they are really just continuing to hone their skills. Um, but obviously now we'll start looking for a mate. Um, and 
so this particular male um, was um, walking around this area um, and it was pretty clear that he was looking at marking a territory. Um, he was sniffing to see if there had been any other leopards in the area, checking out what's going on here. Um, has anybody been in my space? Um, and then basically backing up against the tree and urinating against the tree. Um, and that is a way of obviously leaving scent um, behind and that will then tell other male leopards, this is my territory. Uh, male leopard urine in particular has a very bizarre smell. It smells like buttered popcorn. Um, it's a very distinctive odor and one, once you've smelt it, you will probably not forget. Um, but females will also mark territories, but not nearly to the extent that male leopards will do it. Um, but unlike lions, where the females, they'll have a home range, um, but their job is to raise the cubs um, as a unit. Um, and so they don't defend the territories. That's the job of the males. But when you're a solitary cat, like leopards are, um, both males and females have to defend their resources because that's really what they're defending. Um, and so both will, will do this scent marking. It's also interesting that if you happen to be out on a drive after it's rained in particular, um, cats will often be very active just after the rains because Oh, the rain will have washed away the scent and they now need to go out again and re-establish their territories um, by remarking them. So allo grooming amongst leopards is really only between a mother and a cub. Um, so it is a bonding, again here it is a bonding um, situation as well as a cleaning situation. Um, but unlike um, lions where adults will, you know, allo groom adults, really that's not something that occurs in leopards. Um, it's just not part of, of their sort of solitary lifestyle. So leopards have a completely different strategy for hunting to, to lions. So as you can kind of start to get an idea here, their coloration and their markings act as a camouflage. So the spots break up the outline of the animal when it's in this thick bush. Um, and this is kind of the environment that they favor. So they are stalk and pounce predators. They don't chase down prey. They don't come out into the open and confront prey. Um, they will stalk it. Um, and when they're close enough, they will then pounce on it. They also do something else quite interesting and not only um, leopards do this, other predators will do it too. Um, even you might find your domestic cat or dog do it. They will find something that smells particularly revolting and they will roll in it. And the best explanation we have for this is that it masks their odor. So obviously prey, prey animals will learn what a leopard smells like, what a lion smells like, and so their sense of smell of prey animals is, is very good. And so if you can disguise what you smell like, so goodness knows what this leopard smelt like, but um, then that gives you an advantage if you're trying to sneak up on something that it not only doesn't hear or see you, but it also doesn't smell you. And then you go into stalk mode. And so leopards go, you can see this whole posture has dropped. The leopard crouch starts crouching and they literally do this leopard crawl, this kind of crawling along the ground um, to try and get closer to whatever it is that they're wanting to kill. Um, and in this case, this leopard was successful in killing this little gray dacre. Um, and this picture was taken in the greater Kruger taken at Mala Mala. And because there's such a high density of lions and leopards there, pretty much all of their prey, they will take up a tree. So that is not the case in areas where there is not a high density of other predators. This takes a lot of energy. Um, 
and is also quite risky um, to take prey up into a tree. But if it's between losing your prey to lions or hyenas and, or taking it up a tree, which hyenas are definitely not going to get up, and lions may get up, but not with any grace and not with much, if they've got any sense, they won't try it. So, um, so they will tree um, their, their kills. Um, and so then this is just another kill that's been pulled up into a tree, um, a particularly spiky one in this case. The incredible strength these animals have in their neck. Um, so this young, this is a youngish leopard, and this, this impala is, I mean, it's not a fully grown male, but it's quite a large impala. And this leopard had, was straddled over this impala and dragging it. Um, and then proceeded to take it up the tree. Um, so just in terms of if you think about the weight of that animal um, and the body mass of the leopard, um, the strength that it takes um, to do that is, is really quite exceptional. And you can see here the kind of, um, you can see the hole, if you will, in the, in the trachea, in the neck area. So leopards use a suffocation method of killing their prey. They grab it around the neck and they will suffocate it. They are much fussier eaters. Um, so they are not very fond of prey or carcasses that have been um, sort of left out um, and are starting to decompose. Um, and they'll also, they will tend to remove the hair before they want, they will start eating. And um, so much more fastidious than, than lions are. You can see here how this leopard is going on onto its prey sideways. And you'll see this a lot when you, if you watch any predator feeding. And that's because of the carnassial shear. So that's what makes a carnivore a carnivore, not the fact that it eats meat, but the fact that it has a carnassial shear. And that's the interface between molars um, in the top and bottom jaw, which act like a pair of scissors. And so that allows them to cut right close to the bone um, and get as much meat off as they possibly can. So the canine, the big canine teeth are used for killing, but that is not their primary feeding. Those are not their primary feed, feeding dentition. Um, their carnassials um, are. So this is a very distinctive leopard. Um, he has a really interesting face. Um, and he's a very big male, um, but yeah, again, he had treed, um, he had treed a kill. So leopards also sleep a lot. Um, again, having large meals, um, high in protein, um, means that you need time to digest them. Um, and so this is kind of the classic leopard pose where they go and straddle a branch um, and off they go to sleep. However, I've seen leopards sleeping on the ground almost as often, if not more often than I've seen them sleeping in trees. So they will on, they'll, excuse me, they will find like a termite mound, um, somewhere where there's some protection, um, some thickish bush, um, and they will just go and lie down there. Um, and because of their incredible camouflage, um, when they're down in amongst this dappled light, um, they're almost impossible to see. Um, but um, that same very distinctive male, he's called the Maxims male, um, he um, was also he decided that he was going to hang out in a tree for a little while. But not picky. Um, so this was a big granite outcrop. Um, it was quite, a, it had been quite a cold day and this rock was um, probably quite nice and warm. Um, and so this, um, this leopard had just decided that it was time to pass out. Um, didn't look like a particularly comfortable pillow to me, but anyway, the leopard didn't seem too perturbed by it. Um, again, they're not only sleeping when they're sitting up in trees. They are also very aware of their surroundings. 
um, and they will be something that happens um, even with sleeping lions. We might think that they're completely dead to the world, but there is always an ear flicking. Um, and if anything in the environment changes, um, their reactions will change within a split second. Um, and they will go from apparently sleeping, not paying any attention to fully alert and potentially even capable of getting into a stalking and killing mode um, because that is the way in which they are going to survive. Um, and so, yeah, never, never, ex never assume that a sleeping lion or leopard um, is any less of a threat than one that's awake. They do sometimes choose the strangest places, though. Um, and this leopard had put its, it really was the most uncomfortable position, sort of put its paw up and then was half resting its cheek on the on this log. Um, but yeah, the sort of log is pushing up into its into its jaw. Um, really didn't look very comfortable at all. So this is something that is just for me truly remarkable um, about leopards is this ability to go literally straight up a tree. Um, unfortunately, this lever, it was just too quick for me and that's why its tail got cut off in the picture, but it went from walking on the ground to deciding that it was going up the tree. And this was quite tall before that first branch. Um, and as you can see, it's holding on with its front claws and it's just holding on to the to the bark um, and then pulled itself up into the crack in the tree or the fork in the tree. Um, so that is something that none of our other large predators um, are capable of doing. Um, so I have watched a lion climb a tree, um, a male, a big male lion. For some reason, he decided that there was a tiny scrap of a kill that had been left by a leopard. Um, and for some reason, he decided he was going to climb up this tree. It was very um, ungraceful. Um, his ascent was more graceful than his descent. Um, and actually, for an animal of that size, it's actually really quite dangerous because um, if a big male lion were to fall out of a tree, um, there's a very good chance that he's going to do himself quite a bad injury. Um, whereas leopards, this is something that they do all the time. They're built for it. Um, and they really do seem to always land on their paws. So, but just for me, that sheer strength to be able to pull this body weight up a tree is just extraordinary. And there we have um, the Kambula pride again, um, very proudly sitting on the stones marking the Mala Mala runway. So thanks very much. Um, Rob, if there's any questions, um, I'm very happy to answer any questions or try and answer any questions people might have. All right, Lorraine, thank you. So before we start with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of the questions that we've already got. So does the white fur directly under the lion's eyes serve a specific purpose? Does it help to flex sunlight perhaps? So um, it's a good question. Um, so essentially because lions although we've seen them here in a in a sort of a daylight setting they are primarily nocturnal or what we call crepuscular so active at dawn and dusk when the light is lower um, and so that white under their eyes we think reflects light into their eyes so it just gives them more light into their eyes um, to give them slightly better vision in low light. So it's in contrast to cheetahs, which have those dark marks, which because they are diurnal hunters, 
So one of the ways cheetahs have survived over time is they've created a niche where they hunt, which is during the day, and the other big predators, lions, leopards, hyenas, primarily hunt at night. Um, and so those dark stripes for them um, absorb light, so it stops them from being blinded by, um, by bright light. Um, so that's what we believe the, the white is under the lions and like the dark the, um, tear marks on a cheetah. Great, thank you for that. So does the lion's eye, do the eyes change color with age? We saw one photo with a, a lion with blue eyes. Yeah, so when they're very small, um, it's almost a little bit like human babies um, born with, um, you know, very often much paler or blue eyes. Um, and the same with lions is that um, when they're very young, um, the eyes have almost like a bluish tinge to them. Um, and then as they as they get to sort of 12, 16 weeks, um, they start to go this more golden brown color. So, yes, the eyes do change color as they get older. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Um, so, so um, what when male lions find a, a leopard den and they kill the cubs? Do they do they eat them or the, do they just kill them? No, they don't generally eat. Um, predators don't generally eat other predators. Um, they will just kill them and leave them. Um, but again, these situations are are never. Um, how can I put this? The, the animals didn't read the textbook. So if you read a textbook on predators, it will say that they will just kill them. They won't. They won't consume them. Um, but I've seen a situation. I mean, it was slightly different, but it was a leopard that had come across a hyena kill, a, a dead hyena that had been killed somehow, and it took this up a tree and started feeding on it. So that's a predator feeding on a predator. So, um, yeah, not usual behavior. So there certainly may be instances where you might find that a predator who has killed a cub will consume it. Um, but it is quite rare. Um, it's normally just that they're exterminating the competition. So, I mean, and that's why, for example, you know, infanticide with amongst um, all of these, all of these animals, um, if you kill the cubs of um, a male, you know, they're not your cubs, you will then bring the female back into estrus and you can then breed with her. And so the, the genes that will be passed down to the next generation are then your genes. Um, so that's the real reason for killing them. Um, but I would definitely say that it's not impossible. Um, and it may happen even more often than we realize. But it, I mean, I've never witnessed it. Great. Thank you for addressing that. Um, so are African leopards and snow leopards genetically related? So I'll be honest, I don't know a great deal about snow leopards, but um, all of these large cats belong to the genus Panthera. And so there is a level of relatedness, um, different species, obviously, but um, yes, there would be a relationship. How close um, in terms of how far they would have split, um, I'm not sure. Um, but yes, also, but both the same genus. So one of our guests was able to see a, a leopard pair a few weeks ago, and she seemed very interested in him, uh, but he didn't seem to show any interest in her. Do we know why that might be? Um, so yeah, I mean, when the females decide, have decided that they want to mate with a male, they, they will show a lot of interest. Um, they, you know, they'll literally walk up to the male and um, sort of put their tail in his face. And um, so, but very often um, it will take a while. The, the males, he may ultimately have decided that he would mate with the female. Um, 
but it's not always something that will happen immediately um, for a number of reasons. It might be a, a younger male. Um, it could be for any one of a number of reasons, but it, I've seen it happen as well, that it's not always, the males will not always show interest when a female shows interest. Certainly not um, like the first, perhaps the first interaction, um, but it, you may find that um, if that had carried on, which it may well have done over a number of days, um, that eventually the male would have mated with her. Um, because obviously leopards, lions, um, they will mate multiple times over a period of days. Um, and so um, it, the other alternative is he, they could have mated and now he's just saying, well, yeah, actually I'm tired for now. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Great, thank you for taking a stab at that. So one of our guests is asking about um, hyenas um, and uh, uh, they've d maybe displaced some lions in uh, Northeast Africa as the top predators. Uh, is that happening in South Africa? So it's, it's inter an interesting question. So what's happened in parts of sort of Africa north of us is lions have become so lions are considered vulnerable by the IUCN um, loss of habitat um, the lion bone trade hunting poaching there's a whole variety of things that have have taken place and some of those have happened in South Africa as well but South Africa actually has a really good um, lion population at the moment in our protected areas and so for us, um, lions have still maintained their role as, as the top, kind of the, the dominant predator, if you will, in ecosystems. But um, where you've had situations where lion populations have been decimated, um, also in West Africa, um, the lion populations there are basically non-existent now. And so when that niche opens up, something like a hyena um, clan will then move into there as the, as the top predator. But we haven't seen that happening in South Africa. Um, and based on the lion numbers we have at present in our protected areas, I think it's unlikely here at the moment. Um, but I mean, that could change. Great. Thank you for addressing that. So it seems like these big cats have some remarkably similar behaviors to our own house cats. Now, I, we know that they do groom each other. Do, do they get hairballs? Yes, they do. Yeah, and they, yeah, they cough up hairballs just like your domestic cat does. So yes, they well, do. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Unfortunately, <laughs> that will be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for some closing comments. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, just to say thanks very much to everybody for listening. And if anybody does have more questions, um, I'm more than happy if, if they get emailed through. I'm more than happy to, to answer um, any questions that people might have. And yeah, just lastly, to wish anyone who's celebrating Easter a happy Easter. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll be back again soon. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Lorraine, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.